It is wonderful to be here with you again. Uh, I have stood here on several occasions and it start to feel familiar and good to be back among you. And I bring you greetings from the whole regional staff, including Rick Spleth, um, our regional pastor, who I think is off doing an installation for a new minister today. Um, but uh, we are a gathered people across Indiana and thankful for the relationships that we have with one another. I think it's sometimes easy to be sentimental about love. We can think about it as kind of that wonderful feeling that we have for another person. And when you're actually living sometimes with other persons, that uh, wonderful feeling can turn into other kinds of feelings, can't it? We can be lawed uh, into believing it's really easy to love. I just want to love, I'm a Christian, I can love someone else. I mean, we're nice folk, right, as Christian people, so of course we love everyone. It's what we're supposed to do. It's who we are supposed to be. And yet, yet we know when we are honest enough to say it out loud that love is one of the most challenging things for us. The author of the epistle today We'll call him John. We don't know if it's what John or if it's really John, but it doesn't really matter that much. This author knew the realities of living out of love. The community to which he writes apparently had some issues. The book of 1 John gives no hint as to whom this letter was written or where they resided. A lot of the letters you kind of, we know that it's written to a certain community, we know a little bit about the people, and we know what their, their troubles are, but with this, this book, all we really know is this. They were Christian, they had a good relationship with the author, and the community was threatened and divided. Maybe that's all we need to know. Maybe not having a lot more information makes it <clears throat> more relevant to us and other believers. We don't have a lot of details. And so as we listen to that text, we can begin to hear it as words for us. Well, whatever threatened to divide the community of faith to whom this author wrote, he believed that love lived out with one another was the answer to their divisions. His premise is based on the fact that love doesn't begin with us. It begins with God. Always. It begins with God. I don't know about you, but I can kind of feel a little sigh of relief because if I feel like it's all up to me, things may or may not go that well. But if we know that we're able to love only because God first loved us, and that God's love is poured out into our lives, then, then we have that possibility of expressing that love to others. God's love is made real and is relevant when we act out of God's love in us toward others. Love is not an ideal. It is a relationship. One evening, a small voice could be heard in the stillness of the night. Daddy, I'm scared. Out of the state of half-sleep, the child's father responds, Honey, don't be afraid. Daddy's right across the hall. After a brief pause, the little voice is heard again. I'm still scared. Then the father responds, You don't need to be afraid. God is with you. God loves you. After a longer silence, the little voice returns. I don't care about God, Daddy. I want someone with skin. <laughs> Isn't that exactly right? We can have this relationship with God, God unseen in lots of ways, and idealize that relationship. But sometimes we just want 
someone with skin. We want to experience the love of God through interaction with real people, and that's how we know God's love. I think the practice of love begins at home, so to speak. It begins in each faith community who wants to serve as witnesses to God's ongoing presence in the world. And yet that can be hard and sometimes downright challenging. Church life is messy and not always easy. I mean, if we get right down to it, people annoy us. The things that they say we don't agree with, they have ideas about doing things that we've never done it that way before. We don't agree on social issues or on how to interpret a passage from the Bible. I dare say I've even seen where arguments could arise and relationships broken over who put the spoons back in the wrong drawer in the kitchen. You know, all of this and so much more can lead to hurt feelings, broken relationships, and even worse, to people not feeling the love that they expected to find in a church. It can leave people broken and hurt by the church to the point of never wanting to be involved with a faith community again. So how can any congregation form of a community of love when it's so difficult to do so? How do we love one another in real, concrete ways that make a difference in our lives and in the lives of others? The author of today's letter claims that we have to begin with acknowledging that love begins from God. We have to believe that we are God's beloved as the author addresses his readers, the beloved community. God first loved us and loved us into life itself. We become community because of God's initiating love for each one of us. So perhaps if we could believe that about ourselves, we could look at each other through that lens. If we saw each other as a member of the beloved community, we could see one another as God sees us. Then maybe we have a chance of becoming what God wants us to become, what Jesus described as the body of Christ. Next, I think we have to deal with fear. We live in a fear-based culture. Have you noticed that? I see some nods. I mean, we could, uh, as I'm a more aware of this, I think about it almost daily. It hits me in the face about how much fear is out there. It's all around us every day. TV commercials tell us that we need to fear aging, what we look like, what we eat, if we'll be accepted by others, and on and on. And the news, well, don't get me started on that. It, too, is based in fear. Sometimes in the morning as I'm watching the news, I'll hear one of those teasers that happens that they want you to watch the news later that evening. And it's usually about something we ought to be afraid of. And we usually see the worst in other people, and it causes us to be scared. Ooh, and when the political campaigns get started again, wow. Wow. Just pay attention to how ads are based on fear of something or someone. I just read an interesting article that shared a commencement speech given at a college by singer John Legend. In the speech, he talks about how fear keeps us from loving. He talks about the experience of being a, I think he was a teenager when his parents divorced and he had been in this, what he thought, was a very loving home and then this separation came and he realized that it was hard for him for a while. In the speech he talks about how fear keeps us from loving and he's so correct. Fear holds us back and doesn't allow us to fully enter into the lives of others. 
He says it this way in his speech. Even though we're made to love, we're often afraid to love. We're afraid of being hurt deeply, afraid of feeling the pain I went through when my parents divorced. But you're never going to really love something or someone unless you put those fears aside. Don't hold back. Being in love means being ready to give freely and openly and being ready to risk something, risking pain and disappointment, conquering your fears and becoming anew. Love is an act of courage. Fear has no place. Our text says it just right. Perfect love casts out fear. God's perfect love for us can help us put aside those fears that we carry. We are called to act lovingly, even if imperfectly. We don't always get it right, do we? We mess up. That's who we are. We're not always going to have the perfect way of loving one another. And yet we're called to keep at it, to keep trying. And when we do mess up, to seek forgiveness and to remain in relationship with one another because it is so vital to our own lives, to the life of a faith community, but I think in other ways about how others see us as well. How well are we able to work through difficulties or issues that might want to tear us apart? It's not going to be perfect, but we are called to act lovingly and to keep at it. As the author of 1 John so eloquently points out, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Pretty powerful words. And a colleague, Derek Pinwell, puts it like this. In other words, the very way we demonstrate love for God is by loving our neighbor. We reveal our beliefs as genuine, not just by proclaiming them publicly or by believing them really, really deeply in our own heart, but by pursuing a world in which all those whom God loves can flourish in justice and peace God intends for everyone. And to put an even finer point on it, loving those whom God loves means more than feeling properly disposed toward them. Loving the neighbor means having our hands dirtied, our knees calloused, and our backs bent in trying to see that everyone has enough to eat, a place to sleep, adequate health care, a world in which to be safe as their projects, as they pursue their projects and goals with the ones whom they love. Derek's words and the words from our text today are powerful words. Just think about our world in the last 10 days or so. Earthquake that I heard this morning on the way up on NPR, the death count now at 7,000 persons. And I think about that as this overwhelming number. And then I start to think about families lost, relationships now gone, persons who aren't here, children, parents, grandparents, all kinds of persons gone. And I listen to words about Baltimore yet again, where today there are lots of places in worship where they will be continuing to pray for their community, praying for peace, praying for justice, praying for reconciliation of relationships between races. And we could read the headlines almost any day, couldn't we? To see the brokenness that's out there. And I think as the text today confronts this fear 
that divides and separates people, particularly people in the body of Christ, that for congregations to be able to reach out to our community, to reach out to the world, to make a difference, then we have to be able to practice love right here in this place. The love we have for one another will then be a witness to those outside the walls. Matthew talks about it in this way. He says it doesn't have to be big and flashy. He says it's offering a cup of cold water or maybe water out on a path, do you think, as people are walking by on a hot day. It's doing little things that are needed. Small acts of kindness and compassion are important to the body of Christ, to a community of faith, to the ministry of the whole. Small expressions of love are vital to community building. It's making a call on a homebound person. It's volunteering to teach Sunday school, to be a reader, a new reader. It's maybe making snacks for kids who are gathered. It's reading to a person who is losing their sight. It is taking a person who no longer drives grocery shopping. It's inviting a friend to Bible study class or worship with you. It's writing a note to a lonely college student. It is looking into the eyes of the waitress at the restaurant and saying thank you. It is listening in earnest to someone with whom you disagree. I have been following the blog of a colleague, Jason Jones, who's pastor over at First Christian Church in Highland, and he was on sabbatical and studying uh, the rule of St. Benedict. And since he's been back now several months, he continues to write on practices. And he wrote uh, a few months ago a piece about stability. He says, in one of the monasteries I visited, after evening prayer, one of the monks met the guests outside the chapel and mentioned to us that one of the guests was singing very loudly and throwing the monks singing off. He was nice about it, but he asked us to do our best to listen and blend in with the monks singing. Then he said, some of the monks have sung together for more than 50 years, and they've developed a certain way of singing. In every monastery I visited, I noticed there were old monks who had been in that monastery a very long time. They deal with the same problems any of us have when human beings are together. The frustrations and challenges people have when they share the same space. But they were still there, day after day, singing the psalms together as they've done for decades. One monk said, joining a monastery is like being married to dozens of crazy uncles. But yet they stick it out, being a community together, even when it's hard. Singing together and sticking it out may be exactly what our author today had in mind. And we can do that because God loves us, loves us, and sends us to love one another out of that abiding love. Please pray with me. God, there are challenges that come with your command to love others. The blessing is knowing that you loved us first and that it is only out of that love that we can begin to move beyond fear, move beyond brokenness, move beyond disagreement to truly loving one another as you have asked us to do so that we might become a witness to that love to the whole world. In the name of Christ, amen.